From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannah Meets. Today, I'm at one of my favourite sound studios in London, Electric Airwaves in Foley Street. My guest is singer, guitarist and songwriter Mark Nevin. Hello, John. And you're celebrating a brand new EP. Uh, Indeed, yes. Being old, I love the title, Dolly Said No to Elvis. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, it's a great story. I heard Dolly Parton telling this story on the radio a few years ago, and it always stayed with me how she was approached by Colonel Tom Parker uh, about Elvis singing her song, I Will Always Love You, which is, this was way back in the 70s, you know, long before Whitney did it. And... um, and she was very excited about him doing it, of course, but then uh, she was told that she would be considered to hand over 50% of songwriting royalties, at which point she said, I don't think so, sir. I'm real flattered you want to sing my song, <laughs> but uh, not 50%, not any. So that's a great story, I think, you know, about self-esteem and integrity and believing in yourself. And, of course, it, it sort of worked out for her when Whitney did it in the 90s. And became yes, she did. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, you know. <laughs> So you're a guitarist, songwriter, singer, and your life, uh, obviously, Morrissey, Eddie Reader, Sandy Shaw, Ringo Starr, Carole King, Kirsty McColl, and, of course, so, so many others. You've had a terrific life, really, in music, haven't you? Yeah, I have, I have had a great time. Still am having a great time. <laughs> and, Mark, I love the Welsh Valleys, and you were born quite close to the Welsh Valleys, weren't you? Yeah, Ebba Vale. I was yeah. Born, yeah. <laughs> My son was at uni down at Pontypris, and uh, so we used to go up into the valleys quite a lot. Oh, yeah. I loved it. Yeah, and I love that coast there, the Pembroke coast. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I know you had some terrific early influences, didn't you? People like the Kinks, T-Rex, and the Beatles, of course, yeah. uh, and Bowie. Was it always going to be a career in music for you? Did you always want to do that, really? Well, it kind of started when I saw David Bowie singing Starman on uh, a show called Lift Off with Asia, which was a kid's TV show on ITV. I remember it. <laughs> yeah. And I remember I was with my friends after school, and, we do, and you know, just this program was on, and suddenly this being appeared with Jim ginger hair and mascara and like nothing we'd ever seen i don't think people can can you know of this generation can imagine how how outrageous david bowie was when he appeared on the television the first time and it was just like oh, this is it this is it i don't know what it is but it's this you know and and that's when i bought a guitar and, and i want i always wanted to be a songwriter that i want to write songs i don't know why that was the thing and uh, yeah, so that was the start. I was lucky when I was a kid, my father used to have a tape pal in America, just to exchange reel-to-reel tapes. Oh, right. And he sent me some stuff of Elvis before anyone knew Elvis. Oh, really? Amazing. And I had this fantastic singer, and then, of course, when I saw him, it was a bit like you and Bowie, because it had been sort of, how much is that doggy in the window and all that stuff, yeah, yeah, and all yeah. of a sudden there was Elvis, you know. Yeah. So it's great when you discover something new, isn't it, really? Yeah. You headed for London eventually then, didn't you? I did, I, yeah. Was, well, I left school when I was 15 because I was born in August, so it meant that I would be 16 at the New Year, so I was able to leave when I was 15 and I wanted to get out as soon as I could because I just wanted to do music. And I went to the the, um, the careers office and he said, what are you doing in, Mark? He said, when you, what, job, what sort of career do you want then? I said, I want to be a songwriter. And he says, I could be an astronaut, like. It was around our part, that part, you know, in Bristol. There was, yeah, I love Bristol. Yeah. It was like, don't be ridiculous. No one's a songwriter. That's not a job. That's something you see in films or something and um, <laughs> he says now looking at your results you're better off working in a factory and us, but the factory by us was the Cadbury's factory the chocolate oh factory. yes I said I'm not going to be any curly whirly boy <laughs> and uh, there's a song on my album called curly whirly boy about that and uh, so then I, I left, uh, left uh, to, came to London with my guitar. So, Jane Eyre and the, uh, the Belvedere, that was an early sort of taste of music for you, was it really? Yeah, but it wasn't really... Jane was uh, from Akron, Ohio, and she was signed to Stiff, and she um, had her record out on Stiff, and um, then that kind of went... That band ended and the deal ended, and that's when I got together with Jane, and so it was at the end of her sort of moment, And uh, but it was, a, you know, I got you know, learned a lot from doing that, and... 
By pure fluke, just before I knew I was coming up to see you, I'd read Sandy Shaw's book. Oh, right, yeah. Which is a fascinating book, obviously. And you were sort of her MD and guitarist for a while in the 80s, weren't you? Well, yeah, what happened was I was working in a guitar shop in Kilburn and a guy came in, Hugh Burns, who uh, went on to be George Michael's guitar player for years, but he was a really top session guy from the 60s, pedal on those all classic pop hits from the 60s and 70s. And he said to me, hey, do you want to do, do this gig with Sandy? Sandy Shaw, all right. So I left the guitar shop and uh, became Sandy's MD, and uh, it was that was wild. Yeah. You did some big gigs. You did the '87 Gay Pride concert with her, didn't you? With her and um, Tom Robinson. Yeah. yeah. You went abroad with her, didn't you, to yes. San Remo, was it? San Remo, you know your stuff here. <laughs> You're really researchers. Yeah, we went to San Remo. I will never forget that because. Um, it was it was crazy because it, it it was two generations really because she'd really been booked to do Sandy Shaw of old you know put on a string yeah. and all that yeah. stuff and that we turned up and there was a huge sort of orchestra and like a radio television orchestra and I was supposed to be like the conductor and I'm I'm you know as an MD I use the term loosely I'm like a rock musician I'm not a you know I'm not, I'm not an orchestra <laughs> conductor and it was quite funny and um, it was this absolute deluxe kind of. Um, Casino place with lots of jewellery and and chandeliers and we did this show and afterwards there was a huge party and everybody was there and I remember sitting on a table with um, Belinda Carlisle yeah. and Michael Hutchins really you know and that was like I was thinking oh wow this is amazing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you actually accompany her on a sort of just you on a guitar is that a fact I think on that show we did some with a band. I think one was a Morrissey song, wasn't it? Yeah, we did Gene. Gene Yeah. song that he did, yeah. Apparently that went down particularly well. I can't remember. (laughs) You know, if it says there, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know in her book she's very grateful of of your support because I think you backed her up as well, didn't you? Because in a way it was a difficult time for her making a sort of a a comeback with a different sort of music, really, wasn't it? It was, yeah. She she was, um, you know, I remember at the time she just turned 40, which it seemed like ancient to me at the time. I remember thinking, Oh, she's 40. I mean, why bother? And that's what I'm thinking. You know, as a mummy was like that, you know. Of course, now it seems incredibly young. But, um, you yeah, know, she did come back and it was difficult for her to sort of find a sort of place. But, you know, Morrissey really sort of helped her by putting her with the Smiths on that record. She had some very uh, harsh words to say about the way you were treated when she went to the Mean Fiddler, I think, to see you, didn't she? And and, and you have you read the book or not? I have, but a long time ago. Oh, ago, right, ago. no. She, she uh, as you formed the band, I think she was a, be, a sort of a wee bit disappointed that you were sort of uh, almost in the background when she went to see you. But she's written quite a strong bit in the book, which oh, I thought was fascinating. i see that again. I can't remember what yeah, she said. No, it, it, yeah, no, you'll be delighted because it was uh, all good things about you. Oh, uh, yeah, that's nice. And I know at that time you were sort of beginning fairground attraction. In- uh, it was. It was just sort of like a sort of coming out of the Sandy thing and, uh, and I was trying to sort of establish some, uh, you know, a vehicle for my songs, really. And, um, and I knew Eddie and... And we sort of, and she was on tour with Alison Moy as a backing singer, so it was like trying to find a moment when we were sort of not doing other stuff, and then eventually we did, and you know we, we did the demos that we got signed to us. Yeah, that's Mark Nevin. We're at the uh, Electric Airwave Studio in London. We're celebrating uh, Mark's new EP. It takes me right back to my youth because we <laughs> had vinyl EPs then, yeah. and uh, we're going to play some tracks today. So, Fairground Attraction, worldwide hit. That must have been great for you because it was number one everywhere, wasn't it? It was all over the place. It was absolutely um, it was mind blowing because we never really expected to get a, a, a proper record deal, really, because what we were doing at the time was so out of fashion. You know, all these bands like Depeche Mode and New Order with their synthesizers and duos like Soft Cell and the Pet Shop Boys, and suddenly we're an old school kind of band with acoustic guitars. It was very, very a big surprise to us. I read somewhere it said perfect, described as gentle skiffle, which was unusual. (laughs) Yeah, well, it sort of was. I mean, we never thought, let's do a skiffle thing, but it had the spirit of skiffle, and it was very much a sort of a you know, light-hearted and thrown together way. I remember when we did this gig just before we got signed and we had to um, do a gig so that all the record companies come and see us. And I remember one of the guys from the record company from Phonogram saying, are you actually playing? Because on the stage there was nothing on the stage. 
I went, yeah, yeah, we're going to play now. <laughs> we just got up with our guitars and played. You know, it was like sort of like Cafe Bongo with, a, you know, Cliff Richard in the shadows. It yes. was so sort of retro and there was no equipment on the stage whatsoever. <laughs> of course, Skiffle in a way introduced thousands of young guys to music, didn't it, really? Yeah. Going right back. So, best album of the year and best single at the Brit Awards. <laughs> that was a double shock, was it? <laughs> it was. It was just really like, is this happening? You know, and actually, I only, I only found out recently, it's only thing, I think it's us, Coldplay, Blur, and Adele have done best in the best. Wow. So it is a very select sort of group of people who have achieved that, and we were probably the first. And um, yeah, what a, what a mind blowing night that was. First of a Million Kisses. That was the album, wasn't it? Yeah. That was one of the first digital albums, I think, Mark, wasn't it? It was. It, you know, this new fandangle thing called CDs came along. We were a bit like, oh, I don't care about that. I want the record, you know. <laughs> like, you know I've been waiting to get this record all my life, you know. <laughs> but it came out and they were like sixteen ninety nine each, you know, 1988. Yes. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> of course, final. Since then, it's come back amazingly big, hasn't it? Yeah. I think people like some a thing, don't they? An object. I certainly do. And my kids, when we first, we, I didn't have a record player for ages. And when I got one again, it was ah, like, oh, this is great. And the kids, oh, I'll put a record on. And some of my old vinyl I've still got, you know. And you look on the cover, and it's one pound eleven or something, <laughs> exactly. or just under two pounds. Yeah. You know. Now they're out on this new vinyl, and the same album's twenty quid. I think exactly. Yeah. There we go. You went to America, didn't you, to record a video? Well, we did one in in New Orleans, actually. Yeah, it was actually we're on. Pan Am, it was at the same time as the Lockerbie thing, it was terrifying. Oh gosh. Because we, we got to JFK to come back as all the sort of people were being told what had happened, it was like, ah! But um, that aside, <laughs> going to New Orleans was a, was was an amazing experience. I'd been there before and I'd actually been there a few times, so I used to just save up enough money just to buy a flight, get there and just, you know, live very basically for a few weeks. So I, I, I was familiar with New Orleans and it was great to take the band there and we did a Video where we were on the swamps, you know. With wow! Is it? is it literally music everywhere you go in that sort of city? Really, it is actually. And you know, Bourbon Street is is amazing, but it's more it's a bit touristy. Whereas if you go to the sort of other places, like there's a street called Frenchman, and that area is a bit cooler. But um, wow, you can walk into one bar and stay there all night, and four or five bands will come and go. And wow. I don't know what it's like now, but it was like that then. You had a guy called Graham Henderson at work for you. Yeah. Now, he lived on the Isle of Wight for a while. That's right. I remember because... going to his house. Did you? Yeah. Because I interviewed him many years ago. Oh, and, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, he, he was full of it, obviously, because he toured a bit with you, didn't he? Yeah, he was the accordion player when we played live, yeah. I think he lived in a place called Benbridge, is that? Do you remember? I'm, oh, I'm was, sure it was I Benbridge. I remember. I always remember that it had a sort of, a, sort of um, um, one of those uh, foxes, like a real fox, you know, what they call it... Um, when they stuff an animal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, on the head, on the, above the bed that I stayed in. And it's oh, real really? snarl on him. That was really freaky, that fox. Yeah. <laughs> Did you expect the group to go longer or not, Fairground? <sighs> you know, that was the idea. The thing was, you know, we didn't... It, there wasn't much at the beginning. We didn't talk, tour for ages and then have a hit. You know, we got together, made the demos, got a record deal, had a number one. So it wasn't like we were in the transit vans together for years slogging around and then suddenly eventually so it was very sort of put together and it fell together because we hadn't really established a, a working alliance that was uh, big, you know re, you know robust enough to sort of stand all the pressures that we are suddenly under i want to play two more of your songs one is called uh, our frank by the great morrissey yeah. and the other one is uh, girl on a motorcycle which is uh, on one of your albums isn't yeah it? There was a movie called Girl on a Motorcycle, Marianne well, Faith. Originally. That's right, yeah. I think that's what it, I mean, it's actually called Girl on a Motorbike, but the movie's called yeah. Girl on a Motorcycle. But yeah, it is. I mean, I think that's where the title I think I, I think I remember seeing that trailer when I was a kid and it looked a bit raunchy and I wasn't there. It to certainly watch it. was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think Les Reed, my good friend Les Reed, wrote some of the music. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in London, actually, at the Electric Airwave studio with uh, Mark Nevin. So after you went to Sweet Mouth, didn't you? After. Yeah, well, what, 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 what it was, Brian Kennedy had um, been the support on our tours and we got to be friends with him. And when the band broke up, I had a whole album of songs ready to go and um, it just seemed like a logical thing because we were on the same label and we knew each other. We, we did this project together and called it Sweet Mouth, which was the songs that would have been the second Fairground Attraction album. And... Um, 
And yeah, that was that. Because it was his amazing voice, uh, Secret Garden. You, you, yeah. you raised me up. He did the original recording of that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's done very well with that. He certainly has. Yeah. And you had an album, I think, didn't you, as well? Yeah, Goodbye to Song Time. That was, um, that was the album that we did, and he... Um, yeah, it was, he's, he's still a good friend. He sang at our wedding, actually, yeah. Did he? Yeah. Oh. And I suppose you, you sort of... Obviously, you've written songs with Morrissey. Did that come about through a connection with Sandy Shaw? Well, I think probably Morrissey probably knew about me because of that. Um, what, how it came about, I was in the studio with Kirsty, actually. We, um, we were recording an Electric Landlady album. And a phone call came from my from my publishers and said... Um, actually, I had two phone calls that day. One of them was... <laughs> it's quite really odd. One of them said, Oh, do you want you to know? Who do you have Iglesias is doing one of your songs? You know, and, oh, really? How weird, you know? How fantastic, because you know, he was a you know, huge star at the time, yeah. selling millions of records. It was, oh, that's amazing. And a bit later on, I got another phone call. Said, oh, we've had a call from Morrissey's manager. I think <laughs> Morrissey wants to do work there. Really? <laughs> what a strange day. And um, so I, I got a call from then from Andrew, Morrissey's drummer, and said, oh, Morrissey says, can you send him some music? Which was a very sort of broad, vague sort of <laughs> uh, thing. And uh, I said, oh, OK. He says, yeah, can you send it to Burt Reynolds? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he gave me the address and he said, address it to Burt Reynolds. So I had to send these jiffy bags to Burt Reynolds, this address <laughs> in Manchester, with tapes on of music, you know. Did he used to send you postcards if he liked something? Is that a fact? Yeah, well, he, he, I don't know what he does now, but he always he was sort of well known for sort of replying by mail, postcards and letters in a very sort of distinctive, scrawly handwriting. Which I, used to, <laughs> I have all these letters and postcards, and the first one he sent back just said "perfect." <laughs> <That's it. laughs> very clever. Yeah. Kill Uncle was a, a record of Morrissey's, and you wrote quite a few songs on there. Yeah, that was an album. We, I mean, I like we did the album together, and I think there's a couple of songs that are co-written with uh, Clive Langer, who produced it as well. But otherwise, the rest of the songs are M Morrissey Nevin songs. And then, of course, other than Morrissey, um, you were influenced so many years ago by Bowie. Yeah. And what, what, tell me about the moment when he said he was going to record one of your songs. <laughs> Well, I was in Los Angeles with Kirsty, actually, and we were doing some shows in America, and we were staying at the Mondrian Hotel in Los Angeles, and the, on the top of there, there's a, a sort of proper rock and roll swimming pool scene, and we were there, and Morrissey's band was there, and Morrissey was there, and, and Alan, Morrissey's guitar player, said, oh, I've got some good news for you. He said, uh, David Bowie's going to record your song. I went, get out of it, he says, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and indeed he did. So that was just... You know, I re sort of refused to believe it until I actually could see the record with it on. And, and it was a great... Because Nile Rodgers produced it as well. Wow. And you've had five solo albums, haven't you, really? Uh, yeah. Were you a natural because you didn't sing that much on some of your previous... No, I didn't sing at all. It was I never, ever meant, ever meant to be a singer. It was never... Just not on. Was that difficult, Mark, to sort of pick up or not really? Well, it virtually, felt virtually impossible, you know. I mean, people said, you must be mad. You know, you've got this great sort of career as a songwriter. And my publisher said, you're committing career suicide. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was just, uh, it was very frustrating because unless you have a band and you always sort of, you always, you're a bit powerless, you know, you're always at the mercy of somebody else's. You know, he was in the passenger seat, which drove me mad. And then I just got to the point where it was a logical conclusion rather than a sort of than anything else. And and so I thought, well, I'll do a little album and see how it goes. And I actually spent a fortune on making this uh, album that I never released with huge arrangements and strings and brass. And, and it just sort of felt a bit overblown and a bit like I was trying too hard. So then I just made a very simple album, my first album, Insensitive Songwriter, which was very understated, but it just actually put my foot out there and got me started. You wrote a song with Carole King. Yeah, it was never released. But I, I was lucky enough to get invited to a thing that Miles Copeland, Sings manager, used to do down in a big castle in France called Eight Days a Week, where he'd invite all sorts of songwriters, lots of Nashville people, LA and London people, and put them together to collaborate. And one day I woke up and found myself put in a group with Paul Carrick and Carole King. Wow. And it was it was wow, you know, this, yeah. this, you know that was thrilling, yeah. Ian McLaggan, I think you worked with him somewhere along the line, haven't you? Yeah, he came and played keyboards um, on the Mighty Dove album that I did, and that was that was great because I love the faces and Rod Stewart. And, oh yeah, so that was just great having him there. I interviewed him in London one day, and he was fantastic. He was just really up for it. Yeah, you know? and sadly he's, he's gone now. Yeah, I know, tragic. 
Albert Hammond, I've always loved Albert Hammond's songs. I've got an album of all his greatest hits, yeah. and uh, you worked a bit with him, didn't you? Yeah, well, after the day after the Brit Awards, actually, I flew to to LA to um, and uh, to work with, <laughs> with him because he, you know, he'd got in touch with my publishers and said when I had to collaborate with him, I was I was thrilled by that. And then I got there and um, went to his house, and I remember his little boy was about three years old, Albert Hammond Jr. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> they had to be the strokes, you know. So yes. It was just a little tiny little whippersnapper there. And he had this amazing house, and I think he lived on the same street as Aretha Franklin, which was very impressive. To, I was impressed by. And we wrote two songs, and one of them was recorded by um, Curtis Steigers on his wow. first album. I love Curtis Steigers. And then, and then it was covered by... Um, What's his name? As I just said, he Glaces. So that yeah. really did really well. That song. Wow. Because Curtis, he sort of started off as a sort of real rock singer, yeah. and then he's matured into a, a super jazz singer. Yeah, he's really? a really nice man as well, actually. Ringo Starr, you were involved with somewhere along the line, weren't you? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, well, that was another strange thing. <laughs> that was actually at the castle as well in France. Was it? I don't, he wasn't there. So I wrote a song with a guy called Mark Hudson. Uh, it was an American producer who produced Aerosmith and Alice Cooper and all sorts of people like that, a real character. Uh, it was like a lullaby sort of song. And um, and Mark went back to Los Angeles and where he went on to produce Ringo's album, played it to Ringo, and Ringo said, I love that, man. Can I, uh, <laughs> can I write another verse for it? So he wrote another verse for it. And then some months later, I came out of my house in Camden and... Uh, I saw Mark Hudson walking down Chalk Farm Road and I said, what are you doing here? It's a bit of a coincidence. He says, oh, I've come to uh, record at uh, Air Studios in Hampstead with George Martin. Uh, I <laughs> says, oh, he says, actually, we're doing your song that we wrote. And really? He says, yeah, come up. I went, come up. So uh, <laughs> I went up there and uh, the, on the tape there was just the guitar part. I'd sent them uh, by post and Ringo's voice on the tape and then George Martin conducted the orchestra over the top of it and spent the day telling us great stories about George this, John that, you know, it's great. <laughs> it's it's not true you used to wash up at Abbey Road, is it? It is. Is it? I first came to London, I went to Brook Street Bureau, yeah. a job agency, and said, I want a job in the music business, please. And they're like, have you got any experience? I said, no. And I said, OK, well, I took my name and I didn't hear from for about a year. And one day they rang out and said, we've got a job for you in the music business. I went, oh, great, what is it? And they said, it's the Abbey Road Studios. I went, oh, great, what is this? Washing up. I went, oh, all right then. So I went and washed the dishes. <laughs> well, let's come right up to date. You've got this uh, new EP then, which I know you're excited about, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, Dolly said no to Elvis. It's, um, you know, all of the songs on this record, I don't you know, I seem to be more excited about writing songs than I ever have been. It's as though... I don't know. I think when David Bowie died, it made me think, wow, you know, you've only got so much time. I used to worry that you'd run out of songs. Now I'm thinking, no, you're more likely to run out of time. And uh, and I suddenly had this urgency about me and, and also a sort of freedom, thinking, well, you know, what does it matter? If, what are you writing about? You can write about Curly Whirly Boy and Chocolate Factories. You can write about Dolly and Elvis. You can write anything you like. And it sort of opened the door and, and a great liberation. So looking back, you've you've had a terrific career. You must have exceeded your wildest dreams, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I do look back and think, well, isn't it? It's quite funny. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I sort of like, I, like now, telling these stories, it's like I'm like I'm talking about somebody else, really. But being inspired by Barry and then finding him recording many of your songs must have been the greatest feeling at that particular time. Oh, yeah, it was. It was just amazing. And you've got a short tour. After I played the last record, I'll, I'll plug one or two of the dates for you. Yeah. And looking beyond the tour and the new EP, any other plans ahead? I think what I'm planning on doing now is doing a series of these EPs, like, you know, every, I don't know, six, nine months or something, rather than, you know spending a long time getting an album together and then take, you know, then coming out of the closet after two years and then doing a tour and then going back in. These days, the album is, a, you know, it's not the same as it used to be, is it? And people listen to music streaming and that. So mm. I, I think it's a nice way of keeping things lively. Being old, I still like to buy a CD. I do too. <laughs> yeah. I do. But I, mean, I think what I probably will do is do, you know, a series of, of EPs like this, downloadable, streamable ones, and then eventually when there's, you know, a body of them, make them into an album that's that's a solid thing as well. Mark, I love interviewing people who have written lots of songs, and you've certainly written some great songs, and it's, it's been a real thrill talking to you. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm going to finish with the title track, Dolly Said No to Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Wish your career continued success, and I hope we meet again one day. Oh, thank you very much, John. 
I did promise some dates. February the 10th, the Stables Milton Keynes. The 15th, Greystones Sheffield. The 22nd, the Met in Bury. The 23rd, the Musician in Leicester. And March, March 16, the Courthouse Otley. And March 17, the Town Hall Selby. It's been a great thrill today to talk to Mark Nevin. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. And if you're interested in pop stars of the 50s, 60s and 70s, a recent book of mine is now available online. Just go to the John Hannam website and click on the writing page. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight radio.